Hello, everybody. Welcome to San Diego. But everybody's probably been here for a day already. I got in late last night from Florida. Late last night was 1.20 your time, 3.30 my time, on a flight that was supposed to land at 7. So I'm a little bit sleep deprived. So um, welcome. I'd like to introduce you to my co-presenter, Sean, from Trinity Technology. I've been doing presentations for NACOM National Center for many years, uh, as far as I can remember. Um, 2018 or 2017 was the first time this crazy presenter talked about the technology of using artificial intelligence, applying it to court documents, uh, and then using software robots to essentially automate the workflow process. So the session today is about becoming a robot. Actually, it's about the state of the art of AI in RPA technology uh, that has occurred since the last time I gave a presentation, which is probably about 16 to 18 months ago. A lot has changed in the technology space. But since I understand that this is, of course, live stream, I can't ask for a show of hands and say, who has seen me talk about this before? So to level the playing field, we're going to go briefly into what we've been doing in the AI robot space for the past three to four years. Currently, we have 25 AI automation projects within the court space only in the United States, ranging from South Florida up to uh, Seattle. Um, so there's a lot that's happened in the past couple of years. But we're going to talk a whole lot about what's been happening in the past 16 to 18 months. There's some revolutionary technology that actually fits well hand in hand with the current environment with COVID. Um, we're going to talk about getting humans not only out of the process for the document review and case management updates, but we're going to talk about the process of remove hu removing humans from software installation, implementation, and maintenance. So essentially, the software technology becomes like a switch you turn on the wall. When you have it turned on, you're automating your documents. And when you have it turned off, it's no longer in existence, and you're no longer paying for IT services and servers to use. We're going to um, talk about something which has dramatically changed the industry, not just for courts, but for everybody doing document recognition or document understanding. And that I call as the holy grail. Artificial intelligence algorithms are smart enough so that if the OCR quality is 100%, your quality of machine learning is going to be 100% too. The problem in the past has been poor quality documents, bad OCR, and that causes you to have a, a set of documents which have to go to exception queues. The same concepts of using arti artificial intelligence to create algorithms to find data off of documents has been applied recently within the past six to eight months by major manufacturers that make optical character recognition software to create new optical character recognition algorithms that essentially get handprint and poor quality handprint to the same level of accuracy as machine print. So that means that any handprinted forms, any pro se documents, any case documents produced by defendants on paper in scratch paper and scratch pad in their cell when they're filing with the court can now be read accurately by um, OCR engines. And at a very, very reasonable cost, I tend to think personally it's going to put the traditional OCR vendors out of business. Next, we have a very, very interesting concept. The AI to date in RPA that we've been using has been single threaded. That is, we use artificial intelligence to get data off of documents, and we give it to a software bot to go off and do its thing. Well. Thanks to Trinity Technologies, and the reason why they're here is to show you this, we now have robots talking to robots, handling very, very complex transactions in the court space. Specifically, Tyler File and Serve Odyssey, or Tyler Odyssey File and Serve, Portal Review, and also Odyssey Case Management System Updates, where we now have robots that talk to robots. So the robots do the file and serve approval, and then the robots do the Odyssey updates. So that's a unique thing that we're going to be representing and showing you. Lastly, as we expand into different states and different case management systems, we have the concept or the invention of case management system robot libraries. 
irrelevant of your case management vendor and what your users are doing, they're pretty much doing the same thing. They're accepting documents, they're reviewing them, they're rejecting documents, they're updating your back-end case management systems. They're relating the attorney to the document, they're relating the party that filed it, they're adding attorney. They're doing traditional um, business functions within your case management system. In order to rapidly have that light switch go on and off on the wall when you want to automate your case management systems, it's no longer a special purpose programming effort that requires you to do robot coding specifically for a case management system vendor. If I have a library of functions <coughs> that will take care of updating the Odyssey system, that same library of functions can be ported to Pioneer Technologies, Thomson Reuters, <coughs> excuse me, or any other case management system. That translates to you can have a robot army of workers updating Odyssey today, and then tomorrow you change out to Thomson Reuters, and those robots just start understanding how to do Thomson Reuters work. Okay, so it allows the, the organizations to be less dependent upon which CMS vendor you're using because all of the user training and user navigation is now embodied within a robot, and those robots exist for the major case management system vendors. And then we're gonna follow up with a question and answer session, of course. Okay, let's level the playing field. Out of a show of hands for the people who are present, has anybody seen one of my AI presentations before? Okay, S several, okay. So we'll start here. Artificial intelligence is really a very large statement. There's really nothing artificially intelligent about this technology, it's simply machine learning. Artificial intelligence adds the number of feelings into software where a software can decide based upon a general feeling of what's going on. Machine learning is more accurate. So in machine learning, or what we're gonna call artificial intelligence is a subset of it, or, or machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, we're going to talk about two phases. There's something called supervised learning, which is traditional system setup. So let's say you have um, a case management system and you want to have software that understands the documents that your users are reviewing. It needs to know that a notice of hearing, you want the date, time, hearing room number, and a motion to dismiss, you might want to know if it's with or without prejudice, things that are intrinsic to the document, but which the attorney does not put into the e-filing portal. E-filing portal is just, here's my document, here's the case type, here's the parties. It doesn't really contain all the detailed information that the CMS needs. In traditional AI, and this is AI from anybody out of the box usually, there's a phase called supervised learning, where if you hire me as an AI vendor and I have traditional entry-level AI, I'm going to ask you to, okay, you have 500 DACA codes, I want 500 copies of each document that you want us to automate. Then I'm gonna have somebody at my office or your organization tag each document with the individual field elements that I want. <coughs> You're gonna tag the dates, the parties, the case title, things of that nature. And then the AI is gonna go off and train and build knowledge. Now, what we've learned doing this for many years now is that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot more time than people realize. Your staff's gonna go off and harvest documents. They're gonna make mistakes. There's gonna be people at our end that are gonna have to do tagging of documents. The actual software training itself is a matter of hours once you have all the documents. The gathering of all the information to actually get an AI learning system going or an AI system train is a significant amount of time in a uh, process of enabling a organization. But that's supervised learning. And when you get done with that process, you have a set of knowledge that's used in production processing. So when new documents enter your workflow, whether they're emailed in, they come in from the e-filing portal, file drop, somebody shows with a USB drive, that knowledge gets applied, and based upon the content of the document, that document gets classified. The reason why we classify it is, we want to know that it's really a notice of hearing 
rather than a motion to dismiss, so that if the person submitting to a portal makes a mistake, the classification of the document can determine it, if it's correct or if it needs to go to somebody to review it. So classification occurs based upon the content, and based upon the content, we then will extract the appropriate data elements off of that document. Not just the case style, the case number, and the title, but for instance, if you have a, let's say, a child support reinforcing order, you may, in your case management system, want to know the start and end of the child support amount, the dollar amount, things of that nature. So items that are unique to that specific docket entry are captured and provided to the robot. Now, when we first entered the market space of AI, applying it to court documents, we thought we had a great product. We were so happy we were having parties at our office. And then we went to see one of our clients. A large South Florida county. We walked in, we showed them our stuff, and they said, this is great stuff, but you have a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? They said, well, our case management system vendor is going to take 8 to 12 months to come up with a new release to support the APIs to use your data. And every single document that you're going to be getting different data elements off of, that's a different set of APIs. So you have about 200 man years of effort on our case management system vendor to automate all of our documents. So we went away deflated. And then accidentally, we found this new technology back in those days called RPA, or Robotic Process Automation. That's essentially software bots that you teach to sign on to systems, navigate screens, make decisions based upon data, perform actual data entry into the case management system or portal, whatever the application might be, and essentially do all the steps that an API would have done behind the scenes, but without you requiring API changes from your case management system vendors. In fact, AI and RPA technology doesn't require any work at all by your case management system vendors to enable your organization. I'm going to take a little divergent story because I thought it was quite humorous and you would kind of like this. Actually, two pieces here. Our first client, Palm Beach County, did this without any involvement from their IT department or their vendor outside of standing up virtual machines to install the software on. It was a completely operations effort. So they get some kadoos for doing that. Now, about six or seven years ago, I met a gentleman in New York City, and he was telling me about IKEA and their journey for using robots to do software processing that people were doing. And in the early days, IKEA, when you ordered your do-it-yourself kit from IKEA, and you're missing a set of screws, you would call up a customer support rep, and they would have to go to eight different systems to get you your set of screws. That's a human being signing on to eight different applications to order the screws, to change your billing, to change your shipping, et cetera, et cetera. And then one guy walked in to one of their distribution centers, and they had like eight distribution centers or customer service centers throughout the world. And he walked in, and he installed this piece of software called a software bot. That updating of eight systems got to be a software bot updating eight systems. IKEA collapsed their eight customer service centers to three, and the guy I was talking with was the guy that installed the software on his desktop, and he was their chief technology officer like five years later. So the concept of using bots has been ad hoc. People walk in, put it on a system, it starts to automate it then it takes off with wildfire within a specific industry. So it's widely accepted now. It's tracked by Gartner. It's one of the fastest growing segments in the software space since Microsoft Windows came out. And we are not an RPA vendor. We partner with different RPA vendors. Our partner of choice is UiPath. Um, they just recently had a public offering, and I think they're valued at $45 billion in a couple of weeks from their offering. But anyway, they have some really interesting technology, and Sean will be dumbing that to you. But essentially, the story here is that you do not need assistance from your case management vendors, even possibly your IT. You definitely need assistance from your business operations and business analysts. 
But in any event, this is what happens when you have combined AI with RPA. After the data gets extracted, it goes to one of these little bots, it goes off and does its thing. The benefit of the bot is actually it doesn't take vacation, it doesn't get sick, it doesn't have boyfriends, it doesn't need time off, and it works 24 by seven, and it makes zero errors. And you can spin them up whenever you want to. You don't have to go out and hire an employee, vet them, train them on your system. Bots, you just purchase. Okay, so where is all this stuff used at present? That's fine, I'll take a pizza, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, let's see, I just wanna make sure it wasn't my phone. Um, the technology, when we first applied it, was to automate manual document processing that's going on with e-filing. So typically a filer would file a document, a human would either sign on to a portal for portal review, or they would review it locally, they'd accept it, and then a clerk would do data entry into the CMS. What this looks like in our automated world is I have a filer filing the document. Documents get received at the courthouse or clerk's office through a web um, injection point. Then our AI technology processes those documents, OCRs them, classifies them, extracts data, hands it off to a robot. And it looks like this. So this is a video recording of two pieces of software. First is just a human navigating the Florida State Portal and submitting in e-filing. And this doesn't matter if it's Florida, Texas, California, Kentucky, wherever your e-filers are filing their data. And this is sped up. This is essentially an attorney on steroids. Um, this is not a bot. This is just a sped up video where they're just doing all the data entry functions required to get that transaction into the e-filing portal. Next, that e-filing portal is handed off the transaction to back-end system. This is our dashboard of showing that the transaction has arrived. It's being processed for OCR, classified data extracted, and there are some comparisons being made. Do, do the documents match what the attorney put in? And essentially everything matches. So this transaction is never seen by a human. This is actually a recording now in orange of a software bot working on a backend system. No one really sees this in production. This is running on a virtual machine or in some container. So the software bots appear as though they're just regular users. They're digital colleagues of the people that were doing previously data entry work. Signs onto the system, pipes in the case number to extract it off the document. Case management system locates the case file and the bot is then going to dock it the notice of hearing that was filed on the portal. Once again, 24 by 7 by 365, no one ever touching this document or ever seeing it. So the system has typed in the um, DACA code. It's, it's typing in the additional text of the date, time, and room number that it has extracted off the document. So I have a date and room number over there and the system has, the, the robot has typed that in. So we're switching back to our document manager. Because these things are occurring with no one ever seeing them, we keep a forensic audit trail of all the transaction processing when the e-filing arrived at your organization. The contents of the e-filing envelope the documents that were in the envelope itself, in which case for our sample is a notice of hearing. And the actual XML transaction that came into the portal. So you have the ability to have anybody go back and audit every single thing that touched that case management system that the robot did. We then also show the 
time the transaction arrived, that it met all the criteria. You get to set the automation by cord type and Docker code, so you don't have to do everything at once. So it met the cord type and um, Docker code uh, criteria. Everything matched. The case style matched what the attorney said it was going to be. And when we've updated the portal. So trip to trip time from when I press submit to when my order is completed is roughly two minutes in production processing. Okay, it's all gonna be based upon how fast your backend case management systems work. A robot on a, on a good system can do the work of about six to eight data entry people. Okay, and a robot retails for $8,000. So you can see the return on investment over a staff, six times the staff salary. Okay, so that's what has been happening traditionally. COVID is interesting. It was a, it still is, a very bad situation for the world. But it taught us that people can do their jobs remotely. I have a 15,000 square foot building, 85 staff members, and there's probably only five people in my office for the past year. Everybody's working remote. That's software development, administration, whatever. I am aware of a lot of our clients that have had their staffs work remote too. So the concept of working on data, not sitting at your desk at your office, has gone away. The ability to work remote is widely accepted. We've taken it a bit further. The remote worker is no longer even a human. The remote worker is a software robot sitting in your data center on some computer, analyzing documents and doing data entry into your case management system with humans only being required to look at a small piece of the volume that's coming into your organization. So in addition to the acceptance of not being in a clerk's office looking at a user interface on your terminal to make sure your transactions get into your system, we also have potential of a job shortage now. So is everybody really going to come back and do their jobs? On the private sector side, there's not as many benefits to stability as staying within a government organization. They, they, people, staff members want new positions, new careers, new jobs. So it's kind of hard to get data entry people on the private sector side is what we're seeing from our banks, title companies, uh, and customers that are using our technology there. So the ability to use software to either supplement or to replace people that are doing repetitive tasks is a huge benefit that we saw, okay? So if you're having issues with who's going to be handling my documents or your documents, or you don't know what your volumes are going to be, who knows when the moratorium on rent goes away? Are there gonna be a lot of eviction cases? Um, are there gonna be a, a significant amount of different types of cases that you've never seen before when the country recovers? And are you gonna have the staff to process them? So what we've done with this technology is you don't have to plan for the future in terms of workload handling. You can essentially spin up digital workers with the flip of a switch. So that means you do not have to have job posting, job interviews, background checks, training, onboarding people into your organization. If you find out that your volume has jumped up 25% and you're using AI and RPA, you just acquire 25% more robots in the matter of minutes by going to a console and saying, spin up 25 robots for me. So your um, ability to process workload is only directed by the amount of workload that you have to process. Okay, so in order for that to occur, we've had to change the way that we deliver and install software the private sector has been doing this for quite some time, and it's called containerization. So if I was doing a traditional software installation for your organization, we would give your organization a build book, 
telling you the number of servers you needed, the size of your databases, how much memory, CPU, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would load balance. We would say, okay, well, you're gonna do 20 million pages per year. You need five OCR servers. You need three AI servers. You need a set of components within your organization. Um, and then you'd go off and your IT people would say, yeah, let's configure this, et cetera, et cetera. And you'd take about a month to six weeks to get the environment set up to handle the workload that you think you're gonna be processing. Then all of a sudden, the workload doubles. So you have to go through the same process again. You have to get IT involved, you have to do provisioning, et cetera, et cetera. Or your workload gets cut in half. So all the stuff that you have purchased and put into place is no longer required. So the concept of having dynamic software that scales like a piece of elastic, that if you have 20,000 filings today and two tomorrow, you only want to have equipment available and used for those 20,000 filings. And when those filings are being processed, that just goes away. You don't have to worry about costs of that. And the ability to do that is something called containerization. Containerization is software vendors putting their software, which were previously what you consider applications, into these things called containers. Um, we'll leave it at that without getting too technical here. And then those containers are spun up automatically or shut down automatically based upon how much workload is in your pipeline. Okay, and the benefit of that is that if you're not using in-house data center resources and you're using cloud services from one of the fine providers such as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, whoever your cloud provider is, they only charge you for those resources when they're actually being used. So now I effectively have software that's like a light switch. I turn it on, my lights go on, my documents process. I don't need that light anymore. I flip my switch off, it all goes away. Okay, so in 2021, one of our contracts for a little client called the US Army required us to put our software into containers. So IntelliDirect AI is now fully containerized, spins up and shuts down automatically based upon your workload. So that was a change that we did, a re-architecture of our whole application to work within containers. The benefit to you is that the software only comes into existence when it's needed to process and auto scales up to handle your demand. And then when your demand for workload goes away, the software shuts itself off and the resources get freed up. Next, so we've taken away with the containerization, the, the requirement for you to have IT people stand up servers, install software, install operating systems, patch, et cetera, et cetera. Light switch, it's not the guy putting the coal into the furnace to fuel the steam boiler to power the electrical circuit. It's on off type stuff. The next thing that we did was when I mentioned that there was two phases of machine learning, supervised, the next one is something called online learning, where the system essentially teaches itself, okay? Now, that occurs when new documents come into the system and there's not enough AI knowledge around to handle the transaction. Let's assume I have an existing document type where somebody wants to get a different piece of data off of that document that doesn't exist. Typically, if I was doing supervised learning, I would ask you to say, okay, give me 500 of those documents. I'll tag the system. I'll teach the system how to train it through supervised learning in terms of how to find that data. Online learning says, okay, you just define the field or document that you want your case management system to now have available for use. You define it, you turn the system on. The first couple of documents are gonna go through manual validation because there's no AI knowledge present in the environment. The system, however, is gonna use the operations performed by your validation clerks to build new versions of knowledge automatically. So essentially, it's a self-maintaining system. No AI maintenance is required. That's what, that makes IntelliDact AI extremely unique in the AI space. In any event, once that new version of knowledge is saved, 
I now have two versions of knowledge. I have a production version, and I have an evaluation version. Now, the evaluation version can't be used yet because you don't know if your operators were making mistakes. Somebody was tired, they made a mistake in terms of where their data was, so it has to be tested. So instead of having to do manual testing, we actually run two versions of knowledge in production, the production version and the evaluation version. And whichever one produces the higher results gets automatically promoted to production. So now I have a system that self-heals and deals with new document types, new formats, without us having to ever touch the AI side of the house. So what that looks like I have an existing case management system. There's roughly 500 DACA codes defined in it. This is the AI project designer. A business analyst comes in here and says, ah, on this DACA code, I now want to capture the garnishy. So we find the specific DACA code of interest or file code. This system is already capturing the case number, the plaintiff and defendants. On the DACA code of ERIT, it's getting the case number, plaintiff, defendant, and dollar amount, but it's never been taught to how to find the dollar amount or the, 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 the guard issue who they're taking away the money from. So the business analyst adds the guard issue field. Let's start processing documents. So we're going to simulate a document arrival. This is our validation client. The document is showing up here because it's missing a piece of data that's required. On the left are the fields it's extracted. On the right is the image. The garnishy is missing. The user says, OK, we need to add a garnishy. So they add Suncoast Credit Union, correcting the mistake made by the AI. They say the transaction's finalized. And behind the scenes, we have an online learning engine running, looking at all the changes that are made by the validation operators. There's one version of knowledge. The garnishee has a 0% accuracy because there's no online learning knowledge. We're going to run this manually. Typically, this is set to run every hour. And the system is building a new version of AI knowledge based upon what that operator has just performed. Now, we're going to go process the second document. And it's wrong, too, because the system is still using the production version of knowledge. It has the evaluation version handy, but it hasn't moved it to production yet. So the user corrects the second document, saying, here's a garnishy on my second document. And now I see that the garnishy has an evaluation version of knowledge which is gray, that if it had been used, it would have been 100% accurate. So when online learning runs another cycle, it promotes the version of knowledge created by the first document into production. Now when I process the third document, the system has 100% accuracy because it's used the knowledge created by the first set of documents, one in our case, tested by the second set to say that that's good knowledge. Now I have my data. So this is the holy grail of AI. It's a system that automatically creates knowledge as part of your typical production workflow. It doesn't require a data scientist or data engineer. All it requires is the business analyst to be able to define what fields matter to you for your case management system. As you can see here, the green version, which was previously um, uh, in use, um, now produces 100% accuracy of knowledge. In addition to allowing the system to create new documents and new data elements without having to manually go in and do supervised learning, it allows the system to maintain extremely high levels of accuracy over time with no maintenance. What you're seeing over here on the right-hand side, the bars 
our months of processing. The green line is something called the F1 score. You can think of it as a mathematically improvement to the term accuracy. But this customer processing 2,700 different DACA codes has 97.5 to 98.5% field accuracy. And this is a production court system. This is not uh, fantasy land. So this production court actually processes 20 million pages per year and they look at roughly 15%, the other 85% never get seen by humans. Okay, so their savings on data entry staff, on their ROI calculations were roughly $1.2 million a year. And that's including the cost of the AI technology and the service the stuff runs on. So this is a dramatic um, step to improve the quality and timeliness of data not necessarily to replace employees, because the client that I was mentioning didn't fire anybody. They just didn't rehire when attrition took place. And the people that were previously doing data entry jobs got promoted to be quality control inspectors. So they got a bump in title, bump in salary too at the same time, okay? So it's just making sure that the uh, repetitive tasks that typically occur are now replaced by software. Okay. So here's the holy grail of OCR technology. Typically, software vendors create algorithms or write software to find characters on documents. That's called optical character recognition. There's many different algorithms. The main vendors are Abby, RecoStar, Nuance, Cadmus and Tesseract is a free one. And they spent hundreds of man years writing these algorithms. Well, somebody got the bright idea that instead of writing algorithms to translate characters and what data points matter in that translation, that they would be using AI to analyze documents and to get characters. So essentially let the software develop its own algorithms about how to recognize characters. This is actually uh, a typical document coming from Stanislaus County, California, I think. Um, it just has dummy data, handprint filled in. And it's good quality handprint. So uh, a traditional OCR engine does something called a full page read. It stops at the top, it starts at the top left of the page, goes to the bottom right, and tries to figure out every single character that's present on that document. This is not zonal, you're not telling it where the handprint is, it's just freeform handprint recognition. So this is a result of Abby Fine Reader, latest version, 0%. Missed every single piece of handprint on the document, even though a human could read it. That's not acceptable, okay? Now there's ways around this that if this was defined as a form, you can say here's a zone where the handprint could come in, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not necessary. This is neural network OCR technology. It's 100% accurate. That translates to any document that you have that may have handprint on it, any place on that document now has the ability to be recognized. Now there's four vendors in the world that are currently providing such technology. There's one out of Japan. There's one out of Germany. I forgot the third one, but the big one that's gonna eat them all is Microsoft. So Microsoft has, it's part of the vision package and their pricing is six one thousandths of a cent per page. So my earlier statement about how I believe this is gonna put all the traditional OCR vendors out of business, um, they'll be looking for other things to be doing in the near future. This technology has been on the market for the past six to eight months. We're currently using it in projects for the army and also New York City do parking tickets for a really bad officer handprint. Um, this is good handprint. What do you think about this? What's the odds of anything ever getting this? Probably zero, right? Oops, wrong answer. About 98% correct. This is the German OCR, neural network OCR engine called natural OCR. So court documents that come in extremely bad now have the ability to be extremely correct via software, okay? 
So we've just changed, not we, our company, but the marketplace has changed in that whatever your document type coming in is, we don't really care anymore. Just pick a good OCR engine. As long as your AI product is OCR engine independent, and ours is, um, you don't have to worry about uh, providing quality to the customers. And the quality of the customer isn't how good the OCR is. Our score is how many documents do not have to be looked at by a human. That's called lights out processing. That's what saves you money. The moment somebody has to look at a document, eyes on, you're paying for their time. If you have software, it doesn't matter. Anyway, this is um, what I think is really interesting. Um, we have a couple of projects that are using this throughout the states, um, as I mentioned, and more in this next session in terms of we'll get accuracy results. And also on machine print, I should note, we have some stats. If anybody's interested, there's an email address on here. We'll be happy to send them to anybody that it is twice as accurate on machine print as the traditional engines are. So the typical 95% rate that's coming out of marketing from different OCR vendors now goes up to about 99.5% on machine print only, which essentially cuts down on review work, which is why we track it to that level. Next, I'm almost done speaking, and we're going to hand it over to Sean in a couple of minutes. This is impressive. This is like you had an employee that was sitting in, in a box, and all they could do was work. Now we have employees that can talk to each other, but these employees are digital robots. So a robot taking care of one process can now actually talk to another robot and complete the process on a completely different system. Where this comes into play is mostly all of the um, large volume states for doing e-filings, where you have an e-filing process or on the left-hand side of file or files, but that document doesn't really arrive in your case management system. Somebody actually has to sign on to the portal, review it, approve it, or reject it, when they approve it, it then gets sent by your e-filing provider. Um, I'm not going to mention all of them because I'll leave somebody out and I'll get a lot of phone calls later on. There are significant um, investments in e-filing portal technology that are statewide implementations that have portal review. So now we have a bot that signs on to the portal, does its thing, hands a document over to AI, the AI extracts all the data necessary for the first set of robots to do its thing. And then a second set of bots comes in and does the updates to the backend system. And that looks like this. So the first set of bots exchange information in real time with a second set of bots. So now I have that human, which is previously signing onto the portal on one screen and then going to their case management system to do data entry updates when that document finally shows up in their case management system, replaced with two sets of robots and one set of AI. And I'd like to introduce Sean, who is Director of Solutions for Trinity Technology, that one of our partners that is doing this for uh, county in California, Stanislaus County. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, you know, it's uh, kind of an interesting uh, uh, transition, you know, it's been for us uh, in using RPA. So, Trinity Technology Group, um, we're system integrators, and, and we work uh, primarily with state and local government, mostly here in California, but we do have uh, a smattering of out-of-state customers. And so, going back to a point that Henry made earlier, where one of the um, uh, you know hindrances to getting AI integrated into court case management was you know the man hours that it would take to um, you know invest in building and creating and testing those APIs right we were the guys that used to build that stuff right and we still do um, for a lot of uh, state and local governments but what became apparent was when you hear that same um, business case over and over again it makes perfect sense that it would be great to have this technology and this solution enabled, right? But the uh, investment and the time it would take to get that um, API-based or, or highly technical complex integration done um, just couldn't justify the return on investment. And so we needed to find another way. So um, the RPA solutions provide a very simple and elegant way to do that in all the ways that uh, you know he just described, right? With having a bot that emulates the actions of a human 
interacting with the software as if it were a human, but just churning it out 24 seven, right? A much simpler integration. So this uh, uh, image I think is helpful because um, the way that we've worked with um, uh, CSI and with IntelliDact is we provide RPA solutions that are sort of like bookends to the, uh, to the AI. So he described earlier um, what I would call the last mile problem, right? Which is you've got IntelliDact uh, parsing and analyzing all of this data. Ultimately, that has to get over to the case management system, and the bots provide a way to do that. So they give you, uh, you know, that last mile. But the other issue is the first mile, right? How do you get the data into IntelliDact in the first place, right? And what we found there is it generally isn't um, a technical issue. It tends to be more business process related, right? So I'll give you an example of uh, one of our current customers um, in uh, Stanislaus uh, County Courts. So they've got um, an e-filing portal. Uh, they use Tyler e-file. And so for all of the civil and family court filings, um, those are all required to be e-filed. But criminal court, um, or excuse me, criminal case filings, right, that comes from a multitude of sources. That can come via email. That email may or may not have content in the email that, that um, you know, ties it to a case or parties that they can associate to. It'll have a PDF attachment of a scanned uh, complaint intake file. That complaint intake file may or may not be typewritten, or it could be handwritten very poorly like the, uh, uh, the sample Henry showed you there as well. Or they might forget all of that and just mail them the packet directly, and so there's somebody that has to scan all this stuff in. So the first mile issue tends to be very business process related, which is how do you standardize and come up with a way to get all of this information in one place such that um, IntelliDAC can start to process it. So that's the other aspect where bots have been very helpful uh, in practice, which is figuring out a way to pull all of these existing manual processes, autom automate them through bots, right? So essentially, the district attorney's offices are doing what they've always done. Um, all the filers for civil and family are doing what they've always done, but the bots are now doing the heavy lifting to get all that into a single repository such that IntelliDAC can then pick it up, and then we run it through a workflow um, that takes that all the way through to um, Odyssey or the uh, other appropriate case management system to make all those updates uh, in real time, all right? So let's so show you what this looks like in practice. Okay, so this is a recorded um, demonstration of this workflow in it actually happening in real time. So it starts with Tyler e-file. So this is a bot that's actually logging in and it's pulling the document envelopes. So this is gonna pull a, a proof of service uh, document. And so the first thing that it's gonna do is it's actually taking it and it's saving it to a drop site, right? And it's typing really fast. Um, so this is how we solve th that first mile problem, right? Nothing technically complex. We've just designated a file share, right, that's centralized for all of these things to drop into, and the bot is just running all of these one at a time and putting them in um, uh, one by one, a whole lot faster than a human can do it, okay? So now that's been sent to a drop site. This is where IntelliDAC works its magic. So it knows to pick up all of these files you know, in batch and it's doing exactly what uh, Henry showed you before, right? So a variation on the uh, um, confidence level validation for all of the content. And this is where a human would come back into the loop, right? So they would look at this and you would set business rules based upon the confidence levels that you're finding as to whether or not you would allow it to just go straight through or if it would hit a, a particular piece of content with a low confidence level, that would kick kicked out to an exception queue for a human to process. But the key is that the humans in the loop are now just working on the exceptions. They're not working on all of them, okay? And there were two examples that we showed you. It went through fairly quickly. One was good, one was had a, a rejection issue. So the next step is what we call validating the envelope. So now it's making an update into Odyssey, okay? And so what we're um, actually doing here is checking a status update in each of the two cases that were tied to those docs. So it pulled the um, case information directly off the document from IntelliDAC and then used that to go find the case in Odyssey and make those updates to, uh, directly in Odyssey in real time, okay? And again, very quickly. Now the last step, it's going back now to the first bot that was updating e-file. So it's providing a status in e-file so that the filer can see what's going on with the um, uh, with their filing status. In addition to that, 
it's also time stamping the document for us. So what we're actually gonna see up here in the very uh, top corner, it's gonna create an electronic timestamp. And this was, uh, again, one of those, um, I guess you call it like a byproduct of, uh, of COVID where, you know, 18 months ago, the notion that, you know, someone other than a human being could literally, you know, put a stamp on a document, right, was never even under consideration. But with the, the enablement of remote work, now all of a sudden a bot, you know, doing that and editing a PDF file, saving it and putting it back in the target repository is perfectly acceptable and, and saves a ton of time, right? So this is one example. Not only is it um, stamping it using the case information, it's changing the font size too, so it's readable. <laughs> So that was the one good example in the very same transaction, right? It's now picking up the second one, which had a, uh, um, a validation issue on it. And so this is actually um, changing. It's not time stamping it. It's actually sending a rejection reason to put it back into the filing portal so that the user can take additional action. All right. All right. So, so that was a, a real life example. And that is in production. Um, as of, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago, we actually just got Stanislaus um, into production. On top of that, um, we're starting to expand into traffic court. So they're gonna be doing um, civil, family, criminal, and now uh, traffic court. So bail forfeiture updates, right? Just processing those automatically. And then the next one where this um, workflow that uh, we just showed you with IntelliDact is gonna come into play is with um, traffic citations. So uh, those triplicates that are coming in from the CHP, right, that are always clearly written, right, um, we're gonna be having to get those scanned, put those into IntelliDact. That natural OCR engine that Henry was uh, um, just talking about is, is definitely um, under consideration for you know, needing to process all of that handwritten content. And then again, making those updates in the uh, court case management system for, uh, for that very large volume. So very exciting stuff. So and with that, I'll give it back to Henry to close it out. Great, thanks. Yeah. So I have a question in the back, yes sir. Actually, we need to bring you a microphone, I think. You could be Yeah, I'll, I'll do your... Uh... And I actually saw this as a joke, and for those that know AI, I thought we'd see who was laughing and who knew AI. <laughs> so is the goal, the long-term goal, to get rid of uh, e-filers entering the data when they're doing uh, the e-filing itself? I mean, can that be possible with? Yeah, we did a pilot project a long time ago for a e-filing vendor that will remain nameless that liked it, but decided they didn't want to do that. We currently have a proof of concept going for a state um, that will also remain nameless until they're willing to announce it, where they're actually um, automating the portal submission. Um, and there is a session that I did, I think about a year ago, on that specifically. If you want to see me afterwards, I'll point you to the link of that video of it. Essentially, the benefit there is that uh, some of the e-filing portal manuals are 100, 150 pages long. When you walk into large law firms, sometimes it's, they don't even have the attorney doing the e-filing. They have a special e-filing portal person that they've trained to navigate the portal. So the concept is to be able to do a file drop, have the AI suck off all the information that's necessary to do that filing, and actually have a robot put it into the portal. So far, we haven't had major acceptance from e-filing portal vendor manufacturers, but we have several states that are interested in doing it because they think it will um, make their attorneys much happier in terms of being able to do um, quick data entry. Another question uh, for the handwritten example you showed us, uh, what, how is the data when it's converted into to text, how is that used and implemented within the case management system? Is the court then using the data that was converted from handwritten to text and, and has there been any conversations about any legal challenges if that data, you said it was about a 98% accuracy rate? We don't have, um, so, Within our workflow stream, we added the ability to take the OCR data and feed it into full text search engines. Um, uh, there's uh, the most knowledgeable one on the, the most largest one on the open source market is Solar. Um, so we do have a data stream that goes directly to Solar and we're doing that for New York um, City where transactions coming in on the land record side, not the court side. Um, 
but nobody has used that as the um, official court record or official land record. It just becomes a more accurate searching tool, okay, in terms of using that data that comes out of the OCR engines. What I was referring to is not the full text capability, but the ability to actually extract data. So the documents that Sean showed you go to validation had very little OCR errors, okay, because edits are going behind the scenes. But if you had handprint on those documents and you're using a traditional OCR engine, all your documents would be going to validation because the engine wouldn't be able to extract any data. So the concept of using this neural network OCR just gets you higher quality data on the fields that you're actually putting into your case management system. Yeah. Uh, hey, Henry, quick uh, follow-up um, question regarding the, the question about e-filing, right? Is it worth talking a bit about some of the stuff that you guys do with comparing the data that's entered in e-file with the supporting documents and doing a sort of a cross-check uh, to make sure that those match up? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in setting up a system, we mimic what your users are doing at present on the e-filing portal review. So if you're making sure that all the parties on the document have to exist in the case management system, um, we do that. If you want to make sure that it's filed in the right county and you're sitting in San Diego County and you're not getting something from Los Angeles, that takes care of it automatically. So essentially, when a transaction comes in an envelope, we extract all the data elements which you're interested in seeing off the documents that humans are previously looking at, and we compare them against what the envelope said. And if there's any miscompare, automatically that goes to a validation client because it means that the attorney filed something incorrectly by accident. And you don't want a document for a different county to be filed in your CMS. You don't want a document having a different docket code to be filed in your CMS. A lot of the e-filing vendors are starting to see that there's a real need to reduce the amount of work to review these documents. And they've come up with some interesting ideas where it's they flag a document on the portal for a specific court type and docket code is not requiring a human review. So that translates to it never gets seen by the e-filing portal when a filer files it, it shows up in the case management system. That's great, but it's still a document that no one's ever looked at. So it's possible that the document contents don't match what the envelope said it was, right? So by doing that speed up process, they've essentially gotten rid of the necessary check to make sure that document, which is your court record, the gold standard, is really what it's supposed to be, okay? So that enabling to speed up things that really something never has to happen in your case management system, let's assume there's some file code that no one ever does any data entry on it. And the attorney goes to the portal, types in that magical file code that no one ever does data entry off of, and that somebody has turned on this speed up feature, but the attorney put in the wrong document, but they put in the right file code for that speed up feature. So now you have a document in your case management system that's the wrong document for the sped up docket code. So we actually make sure in the workflow process that that can never occur, okay? Any other questions from anybody? If not, suntan time starts early. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I'm checking we have no live stream questions. So um, thank you all very much for your time. It's been a pleasure presenting to you. And we'll all be at the trade show floor if anybody has questions. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, guys.